On today's episode, we channel divinity by constructing the Book of the Cleric. Oh. Stay tuned. What up, fam? Welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. Today we're gonna to be going over one of my ongoing series in which I've been making kind of book covers for my D&D books. All specifically themed towards one of the D&D classes. So I'm hitting them in like alphabetical order. So I started with the Book of the Barbarian, then hit up the Book of the Bard. That's out of tune. And now I give you the latest in our creations. The Tome of the Cleric. As usual, the whole body of things made out of veg tan leather, but we also have like a stained glass window that I made out of resin in here, some gold and silver leaf. This thing is fancy. And specifically designed to hold back the evil that is the curse of Strahd. I dare not open the book. He may escape. Before we move on to the build though, I want to give a special shout out to my newest Golden Gorilla tier Patreon members. Theron Bolio, Tom Ignaxiak. I don't know if I pronounced either of those correctly. But thank you, thank you so much for helping me out and helping this channel grow. I really appreciate it. It is members like you that make builds like this possible, so thank you so much. All right, without much further ado, let's level up these skills. Making the window. Now, I love the design of this book, and as usual, I have my partner, Middle Miss Red Art, here to thank for that. What usually takes place is like, I message her and say, hey, I wanna do this thing. Can you figure out how it would look cool? And she's like, yeah, and 10 minutes later, something like that pops up. Almost messing around making my job easy. This is great. Anyways, to start this project off, I wanted to hit up this, this kind of centerpiece that is the stained glass window. Such a cool idea too. Now I wanted to start off with that because everything else is kind of laid out around it. So it's sizing became really important. To start with, I printed it out on a piece of paper, roughly the measurement I thought it would be. I also busted out some of this plastic sheet protector, which I cut down to size. Now, if you look at a stained glass window, all of the framework and the borders of everything is what's called leading. And these are just meant to frame out and hold together all the different panes of glass that make up your stained glass window. To duplicate that leaded look, we're gonna be using some of this metallic dimensional fabric paint. This stuff's actually really cool. So it goes on raised and it dries that way. And therein lies the general strategy to this whole thing. What we do is we use that dimensional paint to make the shape of our stained glass window, and then we fill all those little spaces with our resin. Check it out. I started by placing that plastic sheeting over my artwork. Then using the dimensional paint, I just traced out all the lines. Again, this stuff is really cool and pretty easy to use. With very little practice, it was simple to get nice detail and lay down everything where I wanted it. And anything I messed up, I could just go back in and fix with a toothpick. The finished result is this really cool raised design. And again, the really neat part of this stuff is it dries that way. I had never heard of this stuff before. I guess it's usually used on like fabrics, like shirts or whatever, but I love using it. Okay, so for the stained glass itself, I'm actually using UV resin. Now you could use like just a two part resin or whatever and just take your time with it. The time is something you boy clever does not have. Not only that, but you're gonna see a little later on, I mean, there, there was a bit of a learning curve here, that it, it kind of is easier to do it if you can harden everything really quickly, which you can do with the UV resin. Now to place my resin in the little spaces made by that dimensional paint, I went ahead and picked up some of these syringes from CVS. And to get my resin all the right colors, I went ahead and picked up some of this dye specifically made for tinting UV resins. To mix them up, I just put some of the resin in a paper cup and then added a couple of drops of dye. With that all said, it was really easy to just kind of place the resin in all the spots that were made by the dimensional paint. And again, that paint does a really great job of separating all these sections. Now, for the most part, I was able to just drop the resin right in the middle of one of those spaces and it would spread out naturally. But on any occasions where it kind of didn't want to move around for me, I used a toothpick and that helped me spread it all where it needed to go. And here's one of my first lessons with this. The syringes really weren't too precise. Like they kind of have like a sticking point where you have to force yourself past it. And when you do, it goes so fast that it kind of lets a little too much out. It wasn't too big of a deal for this job. Like I, I quickly learned how to adjust for that. But if you can, I definitely recommend like the little eye drop droppers instead. And to make my life easier, I finished off with one color before I moved on to the next. Basically just playing color by numbers with the picture below. 
Then I went back in with a toothpick and just popped any of the larger bubbles that were on the surface. And then I just hit the whole thing for a few minutes with a UV flashlight to cure it. Here's the thing, this didn't come out great. I think curing it all at once and having the weaker material that is the piece of plastic I use underneath, let it shrink too much. This gave it this kind of wrinkly wavy design. Just, just wasn't, just wasn't good. Wasn't what I wanted at all. Again though, it's kind of the nice thing using the UV resin. I mean, the largest chunk of time was where the paint dried. That took about four hours, but the UV resin part took maybe 30 minutes to complete the whole thing. So undeterred, I tried again. This time though, I busted out this old CD case and used its cover as my backing. To this, I taped my image onto the back, this time in black and white so I can see my lines more clearly. Then when painting my lines in, I did it more slowly so that all those walls ended up a little bit higher. And right off the bat, that was better looking. I think my first one, I was worried about it too and I made my lines a little thinner than they should have been. These like fatter, beefier lines look way more like leading. And then as I mentioned before, those syringes were hard to control. So I just went ahead and picked up some eyedroppers and found that I had way better control using those. With that, I could add in actually a little bit more plastic, making them kind of bubble up above the surface. And then for a final change, rather than doing it all at once, I cured each individual section at a time. This gave me way less risk of it all like moving around together and also zero risk of cross-contamination with the colors. And this is why it is okay to mess up when you try something. Like by failing that first time, I gave myself the tools necessary and the, like the knowledge necessary to be able to just crush it this second time around. Look at that. That legitimately looks like a stained glass window. That came out great. I am so proud of that. I love how that came out. It's smooth and clear. And again, it looks like a stained glass window, which is all I really want, right? Cool. And with that, we have learned a new technique. We can now make little stained glass windows. I'm sure in very specific circumstances, that'll come up in daily life. But with that locked down, let's move on to prepping the pieces. So normally when I'm making a template for like my leather pieces here, I take the art that I either made or was given me and, and I duplicate it on a piece of paper that I can then lay on top of the leather and trace out making the marks where all the cuts need to be and all that. And though that totally works, redrawing everything every time can kind of get a little bit intensive especially if I'm trying to get all of this detail right. Luckily, not too long ago, I had invested in one of those circuit cutters, and I recently learned that you can just, you just put a pen in that sucker, and it just draws out what it would normally be cutting. This is so stupidly helpful. It can print on a much larger piece of paper than my home printer can print on, in any kind of design I can draw, and it looks awesome. That comes out really cool. Not only that, but like there's something hypnotic about watching it draw. I could just, I could just sit and do that all night. <laughs> and I was able to use that template right away to measure out the, the rim for my stained glass window. Basically this is see-through. I didn't want anything behind it. So in order for it to stay in place, I needed to extend underneath the leather and then be held on between two pieces. So having marked out kind of the furthest it can be without poking out of the leather, I then just went back in with my Dremel and a cutting wheel and cut out the exact shape that I needed. Then I just went back over the edges of the file to remove any of the melted plastic that tends to gather up. Now the leather used to create this holy marble is four ounce veg tan leather. And luckily I still had the templates from all my other book cover builds. And double luckily, Wizards of the Coast make all their books roughly the same size. At this rate, I, just, I can just mass produce these suckers. Using those, I was able to cut out these five pieces of leather without even measuring. If you want to see those past two builds to see how I laid out all the measurements and stuff, check out this playlist right here. All right, so those five pieces consist of one long piece, which is this whole like framed out gold area here. Two pieces that were basically that length that was cut in half to form the stuff that's kind of in the back here in the white and the, the silver. And then just the two flaps that actually hold the book into place. So kind of starting with the main attraction in gold here, I went ahead and moistened that piece of leather to get it ready for marking and then added a piece of plastic over it just to protect my template. That template, by the way, I tape into place so it doesn't move around on me while I'm working. Now, just using a stylus, I marked all the main cutout areas. Doing this, went ahead and highlighted those areas that needed to be removed. And to do that, I just went back in with an X-Acto knife and cut those suckers out. 
This left me with this nice frame for the stained glass and the scroll work. As you can see, it's kind of this framed out section here that's coming around the stained glass and showing off all the, the scroll work in white here. So next, I use that cutout as a template to mark off where everything else is gonna fall on those inside pieces of leather with a pencil. This I did really lightly, by the way. I didn't wanna like scratch in any indentations or ruin the leather at all. Just light markings that I could paint over or erase later on. I then went ahead and did the same thing, wetting down that leather, placing plastic over it, before I used those marks that I made to make sure my art is positioned right where I wanted it. To make extra sure that everything would lay out how I wanted it to, I went ahead and put down that top piece of leather, just ensuring all of the art was framed out exactly where I wanted it to be. Then I used a pen to trace out all my lines. Using a pen to do this rather than a stylus is a recent technique acquisition of mine and I love it, especially for something as intricate as this. And I was really happy with how clearly all those lines came out when I was done. From here on out, it's just kind of leather business as usual. I cut in all my lines with my swivel cutter, then went back over everything with my beveler to make all those lines pop out. I also used my other new trick from my last build of smoothing in all those lines with this rounded modeling tool. This gives me a super clean look and makes everything kind of look like it organically sprouted from the leather. I really do love the way that looks. Finally, I cut out the center where the stained glass is gonna sit. I then decided to use my edge beveler for every edge followed by a pass-through with my slicker to start making a nice clean look. Now, if this is the first video of mine you're seeing and you're like, why don't you explain any of those steps? It's because I have like a billion times. You just follow this playlist right here. It's my leather playlist and it can take you through all the steps. But at this point, I was able to kind of roughly layer everything together and get my first glimpse of how this would look. And just is not the word. I was so excited to see how everything fit perfectly and how the stained glass fit in. It looked, it looked good. I was excited. I love it when a plan comes together. And now with my leather alchemy accomplished, it's time to add some color. This book being divine and holy, I wanted the colors to totally match that theme. We played with a few different color combinations before we landed on like this classy silver and gold look here. It's just these with the stained glass, it kind of just feels like a holy book of some sort. I don't know, leave down in the comments if you agree. Anyways, the paints used to achieve these colors are these Kova colors made by EcoFlow. The pigmentation is crazy strong, it dyes the leather a bit, and also it flexes and moves along so it doesn't crack and crease so much. Now to put it on, I started by thinning it out with water and then spraying it on with my airbrush. This did a good job, but because I had to thin it so much in order to make it flow through my airbrush, I ended up doing like a thousand coats just to make the gold as strong as I wanted. So when it was time to move on to the white, I first brushed on a layer that wasn't watered down and then hit it with my spray gun just to get rid of all those brush lines. And that actually did a really nice job. The coverage was super strong and the color is really, really pure. The finished result had a beautiful metallic gold shine and the background came out a super solid white. And this is good to learn. I've actually had a lot of questions in the past from you guys asking me how to get white leather for other projects you're working on. I haven't been able to find a dye that does that trick, but this paint works really well. All right, it was at this point that I decided I didn't wanna just paint it. I really wanted to go over the top by trying a new technique. So to really go ahead and elevate this silver and gold theme, I went ahead and bought some of this silver and gold leaf made by Speedball off of Amazon. Honestly, it's imitation silver and gold leaf uh, just because it's a little bit less expensive and I have no idea what I'm doing. And also I read it's a little bit sturdier and easier to handle than the real stuff is. But as like an application, like how you actually put this stuff on, it could not be easier. The only thing you really need other than the leaves is this adhesive sizing. And that's just the glue you use to make the leafing stick on. It also helps have a stiff brush and a really kind of soft rounded brush. So to start with, all you have to do is paint on the sizing wherever you want the leaf to stick. Now it's gonna go on white, but it'll dry clear. Word of warning though, you have to be super careful where you're putting this stuff because the leaf will stick to wherever it finds it and it is not easy to get off. Also, this stuff stays tacky and workable for 48 hours. So there's no huge rush once it turns clear to get your leafing on. Just go ahead and get the whole project ready and then go back and stick your leafing on. You're gonna be fine. Okay, so once your sizing's ready, you can go ahead and grab a leaf from the booklet they come in. 
These are really neat. They're just little individual leaves inside this booklet that are separated by a piece of paper. All you have to do is lay one of those sheets over the sizing and use your stiff brush to push it into the adhesive, making sure all the detail shows through the foil. Then once you're happy with that, just brush away all the excess. The areas with the sizing stay stuck while the rest easily peels away. Honestly, this could not be easier and more instantly satisfying. Like, check that out, that is so cool. And sure, the accents on like the gold on gold look cool, but check out the silver on the white when I brush it away. Hot, damn, that looks cool. And it is just instantly, insanely fancy. That's so dope. At this point, having played with gold and silver leaf, I just wanna gold leaf everything. It is honestly really fun to use and the imitation stuff is not expensive. And then when I layered everything on top of each other the way they go, look at that. Oh my God, it looks so dope. Let's just go ahead and wrap this whole thing up by putting it all together. All right, at this point, everything is completely prepped and ready to go. All we have to do is put everything together to make our holy sandwich of goodness. Now I wanted this whole thing to look like this, like one big clean piece. So I didn't want stitching anywhere. Also, I don't like stitching, I just don't. <laughs> so to that end, I decided to use some barge cement. And because there's not like a lot of strain on any of this or a lot of pulling or whatever, I I'm not worried about it coming apart. So I started by positioning everything how I needed them to go and then using a pencil to lightly mark where the frame sits onto the white background. This is basically gonna show me where I can put the glue so I don't mistakenly glue into the areas that are gonna be showing. Now, because the paint is white and the leather underneath it is smooth, I really wanted to have a better toothier surface for the glue to grab onto. So to achieve that, I just used a Dremel with a sanding attachment and just lightly roughed up those surfaces. Again, nothing too crazy, just toothy enough so the glue has something to grab onto. I also did the same thing with the rim of the stained glass area. Again, you don't want it too smooth. You want that glue to have some purchase. So because it's sandwiched in by the two different pieces, I started by gluing in my stained glass. To do this, I just applied some barge cement to the face side of the outer ring, and then also applied some to the backing of the frame leather, right where it would sit in the middle. After waiting about 15 minutes for that glue to set up, I carefully placed the stained glass into position. Now this stuff is a contact cement. Once it makes contact with itself, the bond is permanent. So I had to be super careful to get this perfect the first time. And I nailed it. I was so happy that came out nice. I love how the stained glass kind of looks sitting in here. Oh, it's so cool. Okay, so because my marks let me know where everything falls, I was able to cut the backing to leave some room for the spine. This thing, it makes it thinner around the spine, which makes the whole thing easier to open and close. It's also gonna put a little less strain on my glue up because the inside surface of this is actually a little bit smaller than the outside surface of it would be. This means every time it closes, the inside kind of back here and everything will get tight, pulling on my glue up. And then every time I open it again, it would fight against the surface in the other direction. Just leaving that gap alleviates all those problems. With those cut, I positioned them exactly where they'd sit and marked where the glue would have to stop on the back of the frame piece. Then I just went ahead and applied glue to the entire back of that frame. As that dried, I glued the roughed out areas on the white surfaces as well. Careful not to get any into those visible areas. Then again, super carefully, as I only had one shot to do this right, I stuck the two together. Happy with that, I used a mallet to ensure the adhesion was really strong. And look at how slick that looks. Of course, I just repeated those same steps on the other side. I was beyond jazzed at how evenly everything lined up and how nice and clean it looked. And with those locked into position, I just went ahead and cut away any of the excess that was hanging long. So by leaving those bits just slightly long and hanging out and then cutting them afterwards, it made sure that everything was a perfect match. I then did roughly the same process to stick on these inner flaps here. Just measuring out a quarter inch from the edge everywhere it would sit, and then applied barge glue to both sides and stuck them together. Finally cutting it to size so that it matched perfectly. Then to add to the cohesion of all the pieces that were cut, I slick all of the edges to start smoothing them out. 
Then I applied a layer of paint to cover all those raw edges along with the inner spine area. Finally, I busted out some gum tragacanth to really seal up those edges and give them a super polished unified look. Now a downside to using the imitation silver and gold leafing is that over time they might tarnish or turn color a little bit. So to protect that, I just added a layer of rosaline to everything and then buffed it to a nice shine. And with that, I have the perfect holy prison for the evil scourge that is Strahd. At last, the good people of Barovia can live in peace. I am over the moon with how this came out. Like, it is by far the most ornate piece I've ever created with like leather or with, with resin. And for, and for just kind of flying by the seat of my pants on how to construct it, I, I honestly, I can't even express how happy I am with how this came out. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and I think it a worthy addition to my collection. Barbarian, Bard, Clark. I think Druid is next. I'm pretty sure Druid is next. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this build. If you did, want to hit me some of that thumbs up love and don't forget to subscribe so you know when I release new content. Also, again, special thanks to all of my Patreon members. Uh, I can't do this without you. I really appreciate you supporting this channel. If you like what I do and want to see this channel grow a little bit, why don't you consider joining the Patreon too? Link in the description below. Finally, if there's anything you'd like to see covered, leave it down in the comments section and I will add it to the list. All right, well, I must go and preach of the dangers of splitting the party. In the meantime, keep leveling up, you. I love it when a plan comes together.